Um... <laughs> oh my God, how to talk about this book. I am nervous because I feel like I have a lot to say about this book. So strap in, this might be a long one. This book is just so weird and mythological and smart and funny and annoying and page turning and a convincing romance and also one of the worst romances I've read in a really long time. It's bold, it's addictive, it's heartbreaking. And yeah, it's just, this book is, it is so weird, but man, it's good. It's really, really good. I think this is gonna be one of those books that is hard for me to put into a cohesive review. So today I'm just gonna do my 13 thoughts on Pisces by Melissa Broder. Here we go. A lot of people will pick this book up and say that it's about this woman, Lucy, who is lonely and meets a merman down at the beach and ends up falling in love with him and fucks him in her house. But really the book is not about that or not all about that. This is a book about a woman going through an existential crisis and that crisis is expressed through meeting and falling in love with and having sex with a merman. Pretty normal stuff. One of the really interesting themes in the Pisces comes up in chapter 10. Um, this woman that Lucy meets in her love and sex therapy group, her name is Claire. She talks to her at one point about how you don't just heal from breakups, you have to replace it with something. And I feel like the book is really in conversation with that concept from there on. And I think this concept is most interestingly explored in Lucy's study of Sappho, specifically in a conversation that Lucy is having with herself about Sappho's work and how critics have spent so much time studying and trying to fill the gaps in Sappho's work. So some of what Sappho wrote has been recovered, but there's these huge gaps in the material and people argue whether some of these gaps are intentional or whether it's just been lost to time and the complete work will never be found. So they have to just work with what they have. And Lucy's talking to herself at one point and says, Sappho's gaps are not intentional negative space and I do not propose we read them as such. The words are gone and they're never coming back. We can try to fill the gaps with biographical knowledge, but this will not replicate the music. Guessing at gaps cannot simulate music, nor can the silence of the gaps simulate the missing music either. But the silence comes closer. And that line, we can try to fill the gaps, but this will not replicate the music, I think is such, that's just the crux of this novel. Lucy is someone who's trying to fill this gap of love in her life with sex. And that's love both for herself and for another person. And she's trying to just fill that gap very literally and figuratively with sex. And ultimately it's not really fulfilling for her. So I just loved how that was explored in this book and um, her exploration of Sappho and Sappho's work. It, it just kind of, it's peppered all throughout the novel and it's just so good, it's so interesting. It's just fascinating stuff. This is a video I think I'm gonna be tossing a lot of quotes out for because I think this is a book that has just a lot of really interesting passages. So I just wanted to highlight one here that just talks about mental health and how we're all just kind of rolling with the punches and whether we're ever really okay. I don't know that we are ever really okay in life, but there are times when we feel closer to it, when we don't remember what it feels like to suffer. During these times, we're moving forward in the void, forgetting we are going nowhere, so the void feels less daunting. We feel like we are handling shit. We are handling shit and doing work on ourselves. And then another person comes in and meets us there and we think we can handle it. We think we can handle it because in that moment we feel like we can handle anything. Now, I wanna comment on how people describe this book and the sex in this book. The fact that some people could read this book and describe it as sexy is so insane to me. And I think they're just using the wrong word. I think what they mean to say, I could be wrong, but I think they mean to say that it's erotic. And I never really thought of the difference between these two words before, or at least not to this degree, before I read this book, where now that I've read the Pisces, there is such a firm delineation between what is sexy and what is erotic. Because those two things get lumped in together and they 
don't mean the same thing. This book is definitely erotic. There's lots of sex. There's lots of lust. There's lots of graphic stuff going on, but it's not always enjoyable. Like it's weird and it's strange and it's funny and it's so awkward, but it is not sexy. For the most part, it's not sexy. Lucy just, she's trying so hard to make things sexy, but so much of this book is not sexy. But here is why that tactic is interesting because I think it's a tactic. I think Melissa Broder is luring the reader in with the promise of sex so she can reveal to you a greater truth. I think the tease of eroticism in this book, the tease of being with a mermaid or with a merman, it's just, it's very much like a siren's call, like the mythological siren. And the thing that Lucy is really grappling with in the book, and I think some readers probably will as well, is will this truth hurt her? when she discovers it, or will that truth set her free? The truth being that human beings so often try to fill the voids in their life with sex, try so often to fill the voids in their relationships with sex, that they confuse sex and love. And if you strip that away, what do you really have? Do you have a life and a partner and a relationship that is worth it to you if you take that away. And because sex is so almost drug-like in what it can do to your brain, it's able to provide cover for a lot of things. So if you don't have that anymore, or if you take that away, are you okay with what's left? A great representation of this in the book is the character of the dog Dominic, who really represents an unconditional love for Lucy. But given that he's a dog, it's obviously a sexless love. And Lucy constantly just ignores him to a really dangerous degree in favor of this conquest for sexual love. And when I was reading it, I'm just wondering whether Broder is making a comment on how people sacrifice unconditional love in favor of sexual love. And if you do that, will you ultimately end up being disappointed? Because sex almost always has an end point. It almost always has a ticking clock associated with it. You will have to get to a point where that is not carrying you or your relationship anymore. And once that is the case, what are you left with? Is what you have underneath that strong enough to support you and this other person? Something I secretly love, or maybe not so secretly. I don't know why it'd be a secret. Something I love about romance novels or, or novels with kind of a romantic interest is the name of the person that the protagonist falls for. I think it's such a weird little window into the author and what they're like and the type of people that they like. And I was laughing in this book because Lucy falls in love with a mermaid, this beautiful, sexual, erotically charged mermaid and his name is Theo. Like, like that is one of the least sexy names on the planet. Are you kidding me? Falling in love with someone named Theo is like, falling in love with someone named Rick. Yeah, I also have a terrible name. I don't like my name at all. I can't believe my wife has to tell people her husband's name is Rick. It's terrible. Some of the phrasing that Melissa Broder uses in the book, the mindset that Lucy often has towards women, I think that if a man had actually written this, I feel like the book would have been perceived as really problematic. But since a woman wrote it, it's fine and she kind of gets away with it. Despite the fact that it's really gross in parts, despite the fact that it's really not complimentary towards women, Melissa Broder was able to explore some of this stuff as a woman in a way that I don't think a man would have been given the leeway to, which I find really interesting. Like, I feel like she was able to write really gross, really bad sex in a way that is forgivable because of who she is. But if a man had written the exact same thing, I think it would have been called like bro-y. I think people would have laughed at how bad the sex is portrayed in the book. Even though the sex is supposed to be weird, it's supposed to be graphic, it's supposed to be bad. Like for instance, let's just go over a few passages. Her visage, when she turned her head to talk to the man, was hard and pronounced, with a jutting nose and chin, but she had good hair and a hot body to save her. She wore a pair of tiny navy silk shorts from which the very bottom of her ass cheeks protruded ever so slightly. 
You almost felt compelled to touch them. Everything she said was filtered through her own awareness of how good her ass looked. The words she spoke merely an afterthought compared to the glory at the bottom of those shorts. She was almost like a vehicle for shorts and an ass. I think that a passage like that coming from a male writer would be perceived as misogynistic or just overly sexualizing a woman. This is like four pages into the book. So Lucy, the main character of the book, goes to group therapy for sex and love addicts. And in her first session, she talks about this girl named Amber, who she describes as built like a female wrestler, sweatpants covered in dog hair. Amber had been in the group longest and was furthest along in terms of quote, doing the work in the personal growth and love department. She made sure we all knew that. Immediately in my mind, I called her chicken horse as her head was long and horse shaped, but she had a beaky nose and big pink gums that resembled a chicken's comb and waddles. She seemed to get aroused by telling us all we were wrong. And then Amber goes on to talk to the group and she says, my boss is emotionally abusive. He's victimizing me. The doctor asks, can you tell us more? And then Amber responds, I can't explain it, it's just a feeling. And as the victim, I don't think I should have to explain myself. And in the tone of that passage or that chapter, Lucy is perceiving that in kind of a mocking way, where if a man, <laughs> if a man had written that, he would just get destroyed. A few pages later, Lucy is convinced, since she is going back into the dating pool for the first time in a while, that she should bleach her asshole, because that's what young women do and that's what men expect. As she's in there getting this done, she says, I couldn't believe that other women did this. Who were these people? Then she did my asshole, which she said she had to do because it was quote, carrying around the stink. I hope to God my mom never finds my YouTube channel. Oh, I'd been carrying around stink for 38 years. Like, I love that she's able to go there. This book is so frank. It's really honest and uncomfortable and talks about things in a way I haven't seen many women allowed. It's bold, it's unapologetic, it's knowingly gross. And I just had this feeling as I read through this book, if a man had written this stuff about a woman and about a woman's life, it just would not have been okay for a lot of people. And I'm just thankful for someone like Melissa Broder who had the courage to write a book like this. Because I think it's in a tone that's normally allowed for men and is not typically allowed for women because it's gross, because it's overly sexual, because it's disturbing. I don't think that women have been encouraged to write like this for very long. So it's so cool to see someone actually doing it and that we allow this and that a book like this got a lot of attention. Something I loved about this book is that it is 270 pages long and it is 56 chapters. Yes, I am so happy to see that. Can we finally stop perpetuating this notion that literary books have long ass chapters that go on forever? That's what literature looks like. I feel like people often perceive books that have short chapters as easier reading. And it probably is easier reading, but it doesn't mean that it's any less literary or classy or smart. So good for her, good for Melissa Broder. I love that the book is structured like this. I feel like this book won't get or hasn't gotten enough credit for how funny it actually is because I think Broder goes to some gross over the top places and that kind of steals the narrative sometimes when I think some of the takeaways from some of these scenes should just be how funny this is. But I think people focus on how weird and strange and gross this is. But this book is just, it's so funny. It usually comes in the form of these like quick little comments. It's very witty. Like she describes women who live in LA at one point as people who buy lingerie in the middle of the day. Or how in a scene where she's describing Lucy having sex in a hotel bathroom, and she goes on to say, as hip as the hotel was, the music was terrible. Someone had chosen a range of sad 80s and 90s classic rock ballads. Peter Gabriel's Salisbury Hill, Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven. 
I was fucking on a bathroom floor to tears in heaven. Sorry, but no. Like, what did it even mean to be alive? I started laughing. Rub your clit, he commanded. <laughs> Like, oh my God, the book is so funny. This has some of the worst sex, like purposely worst sex you'll ever read in a book. But man, it's, some people I think will just read it and just think that it's bad sex that she's writing about, but holy crap, it's funny. Man, it's funny. Another great quotation comes on page 118 of the paperback. I just wanted to read it out to you because I think it's just phenomenal. I didn't know if the universe actively taught lessons, but if it did, the lesson was that I could not handle what I thought I could handle. The lesson was that I didn't need to act out with Theo to learn the lesson. I didn't have to suffer again. The suffering of others, Claire and now Diana, could remind me of my own suffering. The suffering of the past and my potential future suffering. Maybe this is why we did things in groups. Maybe this is why people had friends. So we could see ourselves and our own insanity in them. And I love that quote because... To me, it's not just talking about why we have friends or why we interact with people and learn their stories. That's why we read. Like that, to me, that is one of the most beneficial and beautiful things about literature. This ability we have to feel things that other people have felt that we haven't felt, to experience things that other people have experienced that we haven't, and to learn and grow from that. It's the most beautiful thing about reading, and it's why reading is so important right now. While we're in the middle of this Black Lives Matter movement, read as much as you can, read as wide as you can, because you get to learn things and experience things from people so different than you, very intimately in ways that you just really can't in any other medium. So I just love that quote. I just thought it was such a love letter to the act of reading. Something I would have liked to see in the book is a little more of Lucy's struggles. So we learn that Lucy is struggling with depression and she's contemplated suicide. There's a little bit of a moment in the book where she's thinking about suicide, but she never really makes this, this kind of grand effort towards suicide. You don't really see it happening. You're just kind of told that this is how she feels, even though like, without explicitly saying that, I don't know how many people would really pick up on just how depressed or how suicidal she actually is. She talks a lot in the book about how she's going through this existential dread. And I think for the story to really work, you have to see that and acknowledge that in her. But the way she talks about it, where you don't actually see it a lot of the time, it feels like something that she has gone through and not something she is going through. And I just think the story would have been that much stronger or you'd feel some of the things she's she's feeling that much stronger if it felt more immediate. I think that it does get across in the book like you do buy the fact that she has been dealing with this thing but I feel like that was really happening maybe towards the end of the book. You don't really see that at the start or even the middle. So I think you don't really understand some of the choices she's making fully Maybe that was something that Broder was doing intentionally. Maybe she didn't want you to understand why she's making some of these choices. I don't agree with it, but maybe that's why she was doing it. But the biggest problem that I had with the book was that I never for one second really bought Lucy and Theo as a duo. I was really frustrated at a certain point with the lack of a relationship between the two because very quickly she loves him and Theo loves her and yet they don't really talk about anything. It is so purely physical between the two of them. Like at one point she talks about getting her period and the both of them are so sad because they literally don't know what to do with one another for a week if sex is off the table. Which is stupid because she's a woman and he's a merman. So for the most part, sex should be off the table. Conversation should be a big part of their relationship and it's just not. And I get that the relationship kind of needs to be like that to hammer home the fact that she's just filling a void with sex. She's not filling the void with an actual full relationship, but it's just, it felt stupid. It's not like game breaking in any way. It didn't ruin the book by any stretch, but it's just something that personally, I just, I found a little annoying. Want to read another quote? Yay, me too. So this happens near the end of the book, like I said, she's talking about some of this existential dread that she's going through. And this is one of my favorite expressions 
of that feeling. I just thought this was, this was beautiful. A wave of pain rose inside me that I had never known could be so palpable. I felt that it was gonna kill me and tried to shove it down. The pushing back against it left me with a choking feeling. Who even knew what was killing me more? The pain itself or the fight against the pain? I just love the idea of that final line there. Like what's worse, the pain you're feeling or the fight against the pain you're feeling? And that just resonated so much with me because for many of the things in my life that I'm trying to change or old wounds that I'm trying to deal with, a lot of the time I feel like my efforts to help myself or get through something or to stop something from happening, the effort to do that is so much more difficult than just living with the pain itself sometimes. It's something I just, I've never thought about before. I've never even considered that until, until I read that. I was just, yeah, I was really struck by that. So there you go, 13 thoughts from me on the Pisces. This was a book that I really liked. I thought I was gonna like it, but I didn't remotely like it in the way that I thought I would, or it just, it wasn't the type of book that I thought I was getting into. I just kind of felt like reading a book with a lot of sex in it. I just felt like reading a book that had some edge to it. That's really why I picked it up. Earlier, like last year, I'd kind of expressed that uh, I didn't think there was enough erotic literature out there where it actually is a good cross section of an erotic story and actual literature. Uh, so this was suggested to me by a number of people. And may, yeah, I guess I, I didn't think the literature part was gonna be as big of an aspect of the book, at least from what I've read about it and people's reactions to it. I think the sex aspect gets played up a bit too much, probably because she's having sex with a merman and it's ridiculous and it's gross and it's so overt and it's just not like nothing you've ever read. So I get why people focus on that, but there's a very literary, beautiful, deep side to this book that I just, I did not expect at all. So it was a huge pleasant surprise and such a great kickoff to my 20 books of summer challenge. And if I haven't talked about it on YouTube before, I've talked a bit on Twitter and Instagram about it, but this is the first book that I'm reviewing in a 20 books of summer series. I did this last summer as well. So basically what it is, is between June 1st and September 1st, I have to read and review 20 books on my channel. So uh, the review part of it is usually the hardest part because for me, I don't typically do really short reviews and it takes me a while to put some of these together. So uh, I'm gonna do my best and uh, we'll see how it goes. But in terms of this being the first book to kick off the whole thing, it could not have gone any better. I really, 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 really like this book. And with that, I'll say goodbye. My name is Rick McDonnell. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you guys in a couple days. Bye.